and welcome back to another fine episode of Who Said Photography. One of the things that we as photographers need to know is post-processing. And to do that, we need to know the uh, color of theory for photographers. Cool word. So for those of us that are around, um, the actual color wheel that we have for fine art doesn't work, believe it or not. And we're going to show you why. So today online, we have Blake Rudis from F64 Academy and F64 Elite. And he and I will be going through color theory for photographers. Blake, how are you doing? Good. How about yourself, Bob? Good. So this is your first time being on the show. So tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I started out as a fine artist, pretty much. I got my degree in printmaking and I kind of self-declared sculpture in there because I did a lot of sculpture courses. Um, but after school, I didn't really have the ability for printing presses and all the heavy equipment, so I went into painting. So I kind of painted my whole life, painted a little bit here, painted a little bit there in the in the process of doing all the other things that I was doing. And uh, somehow stumbled upon a camera to take pictures of the things that I was painting. And then I got really into photography, really into photography. Uh, started in 1999 with a film camera, Canon AE-1. And dabbled in it, but didn't really get too far into photography until the digital world with HDR processing, because I like the process of HDR photography. I like, um, you know, how meticulous it is to build upon the steps in post-processing. So right now I kind of pride myself in a workflow. I don't know if you want to call it an expert or something like that, but that's the thing that I like to do. I like to develop workflows to make you more efficient and in the process get beyond a comprehension level of things like tone and color and actually understand what it is that you're doing so that when you go into post-processing, there's no question. It's, I know what I'm doing because I know what I need to do with tone and I know what I need to do with color. And a big part of that comes from my background with color theory as a painter. So there are a lot of color theory studies in my painting uh, days that transitioned very well into photography. Awesome. Great. Okay. So let's start with why the color wheel doesn't work in, uh, in Photoshop. What are the differences? The, the main difference is I call it the digital color wheel as opposed to the regular color wheel or the painter's color wheel. The painter's color wheel, you're, you're, complementary colors are going to be red and green uh, because that's how it works on the color wheel when you have red, yellow, and blue. But the difference is, is that in the digital world, we have additive color and subtractive color. The, the, the color that's, that's seen on screens and the color that's put on a print. The color that's put on a print is CMYK. The color that we see on our screens is pretty much RGB or red, green, and blue. So how you know that the digital color wheel is different is if you go into Photoshop with a color wheel and you look at the color red, um, if you were to press control I or command I to invert it, the opposite color of red in Photoshop will be cyan. The most highest saturation form of red will be cyan. However, on the painter's color wheel, if you were to invert the color red or move it opposite, directly opposite on the color wheel, you're looking at green. So we have to kind of take the idea of the painter's color wheel and not discredit it and leave it alone, but just push it off to the side for a little bit while you work on your digital images, because we're working with additive color and subtractive color. Um, so I don't like to use those two terms because it's, the minute you say that people are like, forget it. <laughs> he just said additive and subtractive and I don't like math, but it doesn't really don't think about it like math. Um, the basic concept is anything you invert or reverse in Photoshop, or any program for that matter, you will see what the opposite is of that color. And how that helps us as photographers is that we can better understand our images and how to post-process them if we understand what its complement is. For instance, in the painting world, if I was painting uh, a robust landscape and my greens were very saturated, there's a couple things that I could do. I could add a little bit of white to tone them down a little bit. I could even add a little bit of red to those greens to tone down the color green. or I could add more red around the color green, right? Here we are in the photography world. If my reds in my picture are just blowing up the image, instead of controlling the saturation in the color red, if I were to add a little bit of cyan to that color red, it will subdue that color red. So understanding color theory from a painter's perspective, bringing that into the world of photography, uh, you're, you have a big advantage of uh, 
of knowing exactly what's going to happen to the colors when you do this. When I do this to a curve with this color, this is going to happen. So getting into curves is a whole different thing because the opposite of the red channel would be cyan if you were to invert the luminance of the red channel. And that's a whole nother can of worms that ends up The opposite of blue is going to be yellow, and the opposite of um, green is going to be magenta. So red, green, we typically looked at, uh, in, in the painter's world, red, yellow, and blue were the primary colors. And red, yellow, and blue are the primary colors because you cannot make red, yellow, and blue. Those, those colors cannot be made by mixing any other colors in the color world when, when you talk about pigments and paints. But now things kind of change a little bit when you get in the digital world. Um, the primary colors, I actually, I actually think that there's about six primary colors in the digital world. You've got R, G, red, green, and blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Correct. And on my desk and probably on your desk is a color wheel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to get the right colors to print out. But you know what? Um, Let's go back. You wrote a book. You have a full course on color theory for photographers. And, and this is why I wanted to have you on the show, because the course just blew my mind. It, it went back, if I, if I go back to using the color wheel uh, for a fine art photographer or for anything else, um, you basically have taken this to another level, uh, another step, and it's basically based on Photoshop. So colors affect us emotionally and um ideologically um where things like that now you've in your book in your pdf file um you explain to what colors affect each of us can you go through that again for us i know you've got a pdf on this yep i'm looking at it over here on the side <laughs> um <laughs> The, the basic idea behind color, and this is, you can give generalizations of color, but it's the same thing as giving generalizations of people. So I can generally say that the color red, if used in some instances, will be violent. But at the same time, the color red can invoke power. It can invoke strength. But on the flip side of things, the negative side of it, you have positives and negatives to each color. And each person is going to be affected by those colors differently. I personally don't really care too much for the color red. I just never really have. But I love the color blue. It does things to me emotionally that I connect to that color in ways that I don't connect to other colors out there. That's why a lot of the stuff in my promotional materials for F64 Academy is uh, hashtag 2489C3. That's the HTML code for <laughs> the color that I love so much. <laughs> you know, But it, colors will do things to us. And we don't know what it's going to do to the viewer. But what we do know is that when we use these colors in these certain ways, we can change the entire mood of a scene. We can change the mood of a scene. So if we have a picture of a tree and we envelope that tree in the color blue, it'll be calming. It'll make us feel at peace. But if we en envelope that tree in the color red or orange, it's going to be violent. It's going to give us feelings of that tree is going to burn. But if we envelope it in blue, it's it's subtle. It's, it's we're, we're, we're calmed. Our nerves get calmed. Uh, blue typically does calm us. If you look at the fast food world, look at all the fast food industries as you're driving down the highway. Look at the colors that they use. They use red and yellow because red and yellow actually make us hungry. They Colors can physically move us too. So when you know the aspects of color and you bring that into your, into your um, editing world, you can now manipulate the viewer with color without them even knowing it. It's subliminal. And when it's used effectively, and effectively subliminally, um, you, the, the artist photographer, have complete control over the viewer's experience. But you don't know how they're going to experience that color. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of red, but I love the color blue. If I see the color blue in there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gravitate towards that image. I will see that in a gallery and I will beeline towards it because I love that color. So you have to think about these things when you're post-processing your images. If colors are extremely saturated, they're going to come off as violent to our eyes. Our eyes don't like super saturated things. So those are things to keep in mind when it comes to mood and color and how people perceive things based off of what is in front of them. Uh, yeah, no, that kind of makes sense. That makes sense. I understand that. So in curves, we can add the 
opposite color and it will bring down the tone. So you've got a really good explanation in the book on how primaries and, and the other colors, I haven't got the book in front of me. Um, bring up your PDF for us, please. <laughs> Share screen. And, and, and just, I, I would like these people to see exactly um, how a lot of these colors work, uh, work together. Because you've got this great example on, on, on yours for color interaction. Um, so if we can just kind of go through this and how it, it, it actually works, because like this one, yeah, and this one here, it, it's, it's it's the center square on this is the same color, right? But you can see because of the white and the black, the differences be how the gray and the black works and the gray and the white works. Yes, but it's not yes. it's not just this is this is a simple way of looking at it but if mm -hmm. you move up a little bit to some of the other colors so this is even more interesting so you've got the red and the cyan here and the squares are the exact same so mm -hmm. my question is because i've been using photoshop for like 10 years and it's like some of this stuff never came to my mind how did you pick up on this um, really one thing I did, uh, this is, this is an interesting one right here. Just talk about this before I get into that. You talk about color intensity based off of this. If you actually were to take this and turn this into a black and white image, this gray square is the same value as this blue. This gray square is the same value as this yellow and these blue and yellows are the same value. So if you were to desaturate this image and take all the color out of it, it would be all the same color gray. But you see the intensity difference that's happening in this when this gray is on this blue and when this gray is on this yellow. So even though tonally, they're all the same color. If you were to turn this into a black and white image, all the tones are the same. Um, that's the interesting thing about color intensity and how color works. Now, where I got into this, um, when I was painting, I was doing a lot of, do you want me to stop sharing my screen now? Sure. Okay. <laughs> when I was painting, I, I challenged myself to paint two identical paintings. They were about this big. So they were only about uh, maybe eight inches by eight inches. But the whole idea was anything I painted on this side, I would paint in reverse on this side, and I would try to invert the colors in my mind. So my goal was to try and understand color theory. And this is funny because this is the important part in the painting world versus the digital world and you're going to understand why this is funny in a second so i painted this image this painting to look exactly like this one it was all abstraction right so if i use blue over here i used orange over here if i use red over here i use green over here so i painted both of these paintings to be completely reversed and inverted as far as the color spectrum is concerned so when i brought that image into photoshop and i inverted it none of my colors were this were what i painted on the other one and I was so pissed at myself, like literally, I was mad <laughs> okay. because my colors didn't match. But if you think about it, the color in the painting world is not the same as the color in the digital world. And it wasn't until 10 years later that I discovered that. And then the light bulb clicked. So the paintings that I painted are the right inverses of each other in the painting color wheel world. So then when I started to dive into color for for color theory for photographers, I realized, wait a second, that painting probably was right in the painting world, but it wasn't right in the digital world because the inverse of blue would be yellow. So I should have painted yellow, but the inverse on the painter's color wheel versus the digital color wheel. So once I discovered that, once I discovered that there's a huge difference here, I had to dive into it a little bit deeper. And that's where all this stuff came in with color theory for photographers. I was like, okay, if painters use this color theory so much to control the viewers. And we love the paintings that we see in Da Vinci and Van Gogh and all these um, Cezanne and these great painters of the, of the day. They studied color theory extensively. They put themselves through, through uh, you know, all kinds of challenges with their color theory to get you to feel something when you looked at their paintings, not just with their paint strokes, but also with the color choices. But a lot of times as photographers, we don't think to that level of editing our images. We think literally based on what we've seen, which actually puts us at a hindrance as photographers. As photographers, we're already at a hindrance. Uh, painters have, a, have a, a great um, niche or genre of the arts, if you want to call it that. Because when you look at a painting, 
you're looking at the color, you're looking at the brush strokes, you're looking at the paint application. You have three things that you're looking at when you're looking at that image. What are you looking at with a, with a photograph? You're looking at a flat picture of something that your brain already recognizes. So viewer retention on a photograph is only about maybe five to eight seconds. Viewer retention on a painting can be anywhere from a minute to three minutes because they can captivate you with not only color, but also with brush strokes, with the subject matter and how they develop the scene. As photographers, we typically don't get that opportunity. I can't say, hey, Half Dome, can you move over a little bit to the left? And I can't paint Half Dome in Yosemite, <laughs> moved over, you know, but you can paint it wherever you want to. The right. thing about photography, we take literal things. We take pictures of literal things. So what control do we have? Sometimes we don't have control over the subject matter. We definitely don't have control over the weather. If you're a landscape photographer, I can tell someone to move their chin if I'm doing a portrait, but the, the next level of photography post-processing then comes with color and how you see color and how you let the viewer see those colors. So color theory is critical. If you don't understand it and you're post-processing your images, you're missing a huge element to your control over the viewer. Yeah, well, see, th this is where I was about six months ago was trying to understand um, color theory. I just wasn't able to capture it. Like I said, I was using an, old, an old, older color wheel uh, I understand the opposite between the two, but I really didn't understand how Photoshop worked with color and how I can make certain colors pop uh, and make things work. So after your course, uh, and your course basically, again, tone, color, uh, and effects, uh, with those three ideas in there, it, I was able to better understand how I can control my colors and what items I want to make sure that are popping off the page. Uh, Cause there's so much there that you want to make sure that's that the image that I've done, uh, my mind, what I see is the viewer is seeing the same sort of idea and we can control that with color. Right. Um, one of the biggest things that I, again, blew my mind away was how I control color with curves. Mm hmm. I had, powerful. oh, very powerful. Um, was it, I think it was one of your courses that I took um, or one of your YouTube videos I watched. I'm sure it was you. Uh, if it wasn't, I apologize. That's it's, fine. <laughs> basically, it, it's uh, curves are curves or, or levels is level, but curves can be levels and curves. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and some of these things like, just blow my mind. It, it, it's like I've been using Photoshop because I've 10 years. Curves are three dimensional. They are. Yeah, it, it really is. It's very, very powerful. Uh, and but I don't you, think really understand it. One of the things about that course is the courses in the zone system express, I go over tone, color and artistic effects. And when you segregate a color onto a curve, you now have complete control over that color as a painter would. Now, if you're in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom and you move the red slider and you change the hue, the saturation, the lightness, red actually has a little bit, because you're dealing with the red channel, has a little bit of yellow in it, has a little bit of orange. So when you move that, you're not getting a good real collection of the color red. When you segregate red onto its own mask and you adjust the curve, you can now say, okay, red, I need you to get darker in the darkest areas of red, but stay light here because I don't want you to move here. And then you can say, okay, well, red, I need you to get a little bit more red. So you can go into the red channel of the color red and say, boom, just a little bit more red. Then you can go into the blue channel and make that red a little bit more yellow. So now you basically, if you imagine yourself with a palette in your hand, mixing paints and putting it on your photograph, that's what you're doing. You're becoming a painter of not only light now, but also a painter of color. And some people will say, well, doesn't that get into the realm of, you know, not displaying, uh, you know, actual what was actually there? Well, for the most part, um, you do get into an artistic realm that way. But if you're not doing things for photojournalistic sake and you're doing things for art's sake, anything goes, anything goes. Change that red to purple. I don't care <laughs> if you think that looks good. Do what you feel that you need to do to get that image to look like you imagined it. I mean, it's in your head in your head that's exactly it. you're the one that was at the scene or the right you took the picture from but yeah okay so people have to understand too like if you had a curves level and you want to make an adjustment 
uh, bring down the reds and you bring it down, you've got a great um, little uh, page on that one as well, that you can add cyan to it. Um, and I don't think a lot of people understand that. Yeah, so this is a basic selection from, you know, when we're talking about the curve, the curve is right here. Um, this bottom portion is your darkest darks. The middle portion is your your midtones, and the top portion is your lights. So people know that when you manipulate a curve on an RGB level or the luminance level, you move it up, it gets lighter. You move it down, it gets darker. That's the simplest form, and that's what this this shows. But what they don't show in Photoshop or any other program that I've ever seen, when you go into the red channel of a curve, the top when you move it up gets more red. When you move it down, it doesn't get lighter or darker when you do this. It increases or decreases the intensity of the red channel. So increase the intensity, make it more red. Decrease intensity, make it more cyan. Same thing with the green channel. The opposite of green, if you move it up, is green. Or the opposite would be magenta, and then blue and yellow. And that's why I show the color wheel down here also to show you that the color wheel is definitely different when it comes to the digital world. And this is why. This is your proof that the color wheel is different in the digital world because we're dealing with additive color and subtractive color. We're dealing with what we see on our monitors and what we see in print. And those have to be, they have to be paired up in the digital world. In order for you to take a digital image and print it, you have to have some kind of equal balance of, you know, red doesn't necessarily print. You, get, you know, you have CMYK, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Well, that's exactly it. Yeah. So again, this is one of those things that when I read this, it, it's like I had to go to the computer and try this. <laughs> it's yeah. not that I didn't believe you. I had to go try it. No, you have to. It's and it's addicting. It's it's one of those things that I mean, I'm not done. I have got so <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I get so um, you know, charged by this because there's so much to discover in in the world of color theory for photographers. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people that that do a whole lot of research on it. And when they do, they typically do it to a level that you can't comprehend. You know, it's like, okay, this guy's way over my head. He's talking about ones and zeros and dots and pixels. And I just need to know what's happening when I do this. And that's, I mean, that's the big thing. You know, it, it's not just being able to know technically what happens, but also be able to respond to it as an artist when you do it. Well, that's exactly it. You know, and once you kind of understand it, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, what with with your color wheel, once you understand it, you know what's going to happen. It's, right. it's not playing anymore. It's understanding exactly what's happening with Photoshop and how it's going to affect uh, one another. So right. that's a good thing. So again, I'm over time. So I got to cut yeah. this. Again, <laughs> thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to Shaw TV for letting me use their studio. Uh, thanks to my wife's in the control room there. <laughs> <laughs> all the video for us and we'll see you next time. oh yeah um don't forget to like and subscribe um to my youtube channel i'll leave a link to blake's youtube channel which is a, a great he, every week he puts out um a youtube video they're great i love them great information coming from them uh, i gotta run <laughs> see you next <laughs> time on, uh, who said photography guys thanks thanks Oh, stop, look at that.